The Riley and Kimmy shows at Spooky Empire in Orlando, and I have the pleasure of actually talking to somebody who was part of my childhood, and I'm sure part of yours too, and that is Lance Kerwin. Hello, Lance. Hello. It's good to be with you today. Now, I'm going to jump to one thing real quick here, and that is Salem's Lot. You had the fortune of acting with David Soule, James Mason. What was that like, James Mason? I, I just, I can't imagine, for our listeners and our viewers, they know James was very big in the golden age of cinema. Yes. Was he standoffish to a young Lance Kerwin? Did he, or did he, no, or did he work with you? It was amazing, you just loved to listen to him. Just to listen to how he spoke, you know, I loved that. But he, um, he was kind of, what I, I guess I'd call it like down to earth. You know, he was telling, you know, crude jokes, that kind of thing. Really? And everybody would be like, did James Mason just tell a joke? You know, oh, wow. <laughs> and he'd laugh on, you know. And so, so that was really neat. He, um, very professional. He was about his work, you know. Um, uh, he listened to the directors. He took, you know, he took advice. He worked and he was great with the other actors. He was very giving. Um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, um, Certainly an honor to work with And you know, like, I've, I've had that kind of a blessing my whole career. You know, my first series was with Glenn Ford and Julie oh, Harris, yes. the family Holvac. Um, I started, the first show I ever did was called uh, Diabolique, and they re named it um, Reflections of a Murder. It was Joan Hackett, Tuesday Weld, Sam Waterston. Wow. Right? And I did um, Charles Bronson and Lee Marvin in uh, Bad Men of the West. I, I um, got to work with Robert Mitchum. Oh. You know, I don't know if you saw that show, it's called A Killer in the Family. I've seen a clip. Yeah, it was uh, Eric Stoltz, James Spader, uh, Robert Mitchum, uh, Stuart Margolin, who I loved. And, um, you know, those guys, they, they didn't take themselves seriously, but they took their work seriously, you know, and, and they weren't flipping about it. All. Mitchum was like, they would, they would see, okay, so is you remember Robert Mitchum, yes. right? Yes, oh yes. Yeah, and so he would, um, he kind of talked like a beatnik. So really? me and this cat, we went on down to this broad's place. We were kicking it at her pad, you know, <laughs> and like, yeah, it sounded almost contemporary, right? But right. you could tell it was that was some beatnik stuff, and um, and he'd be telling you a story, and you'd be listening. He'd be dead locked eyed with you, and he's telling you a story. And they'd be say, the camera's rolling, ready for you on the set, Lance, Mr. Mitchum, ready for you, but you got James Mason, like you got. Right? Looking right. you in the eye. Right. And you're not going anywhere. He's just going to sit there. <laughs> and like, the camera's rolling, please, Mitch. And so he'd go, and he'd stand on his mark, and he would say his line, and then he'd go back to the story. Wow. And they'd say, like, Mr. Mason, did you want to do it again? And he'd say, I didn't want to do it the first time. <laughs> right? Like, if you got what you want, let's, let's move on. So it, it was really neat to... to did they work with people of that era, you know? Mm. I liked it for my mom because she loved film and all of that, and you know, so I always loved that. And um, that's kind of how my career's been, yeah. Was, when you had James at 15, and it was James at 16 too, wasn't it? And then they make it that. Mm -hmm. Did you find it real fast fame? I mean, that it hit you, or did, were you aware of it? Or was it because you were in so much production, you weren't really aware of how big the show was? I don't know. Is that my only two options? No, you? no. Fill, fill in the blank. <laughs> sort of like match game. Yeah. Fill in the blank. Uh, were you aware it was growing as you were doing the show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Life, you ch life changes so drastically, so dramatically. Did they treat but you differently? No. The thing is, I still had to go home and do dishes. <laughs> You know, I still had to go home and do my chores. So my time and energy was changed, but who I am, I've hopefully stayed the same. I've had some ups and downs in life. Well, I'm just gonna I hope to stay the same. I'm just going to ask you about that. Is you have, it's amazing what you went through. I'm, I'm serious. You, from stardom to some hard times. And you're with us. You, you recovered. Barely. No, you're with us. You recovered. You have a story. Have you ever thought of writing the autobiography? Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a movie. It's really? A, I'm just not sure if it's a comedy or a tragedy. Or, well, how about or both? action adventure. Or, um, you know, um, a porno. Uh, oh. I, I don't really know what kind of film it is, but I'm looking for my ending. <laughs> now, back to the autobiography. If it w became a movie, who would you want to play a young you? Is there somebody in mind? 
Am I not an option? Well, I guess with computer makeup and, and voices and everything. Yeah, did I you see it. Val Kilmer in uh, uh, Maverick? That's Not true. What they did with his voice? That's true. If they can put a nice, you know, if they can put hair on me, that'd yeah. be a good start. I mean, I had a beautiful head of hair. What the heck happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to ask what happened. I'm not, I'm not going to um, ask. <laughs> you know. I don't um, have an idea of who would play me. I never thought that. But it's amazing the amount of talent that is out there now. And what director would you like? Well, it, it, Toby Hooper's not available. Um, I, I, I guess it would be, depend on what genre it fell into. You know what I, if it was action adventure, I don't know, maybe I'd have a Ridley Scott or a Tony Scott do it. What, what about Quentin Tarantino? QT, did you see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? That's cool. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I have to change my answer, dude. Absolutely, Quentin Tarantino. Absolutely. QT, this is your new movie. Let's put it together. <laughs> now, one quick question. I'm going to let you go because you got a lot of fans waiting. And that it. Well, well, okay, then I'll. All right. What happened? You, you, had, you had fame, you had TV shows, you, you were everywhere magazines and, and films. What happened? I guess I guess I got lucky. I guess I got blessed to be able to take a break like that. Not many do. Um, I've been able to raise kids and go. You know, a lot of kids who are actors would say they miss their childhood. I didn't love the heck out of my childhood. You know, the positive aspect of a minor working in the motion picture industry are not talked about a lot. They talk about exposure to vulgarity, uh, money being taken, right. um, not learning skills for later in life. They talk about all the, you know, the, the, the negative aspects that are there in everything. But the positive aspects of a minor working in is incredible. I don't know if you know or not, but like, I was everything that the book described. I was dyslexic, uh, artistic, uh, um, ADHD, right? Uh, um, no attention span. I got four Fs in one D. The year I told my parents I wanted to become an actor, and they laughed and said, "You know, you need to be. You need to learn how to read." They said, "You can do it, but you've got some work." They said, "So get going on it." And so we started reading at home. And by the second year after that, I mean, I was the highest reader in the school. Yeah, and um, you know, I just got motivated. And if you apply yourself to something and you dream about it a lot, you can you can achieve it. And my parents were fully supportive. We started going on auditions, and um, I think the first year I did like 13 shows. Get I'm out of here. I'm at about 130 right now, and it's been quite a ride. Now you. Um, obviously were rejected. I, I, I try to bring that up because a lot of people want to go into the entertainment industry and they don't realize there's a lot of rejection. Oh yeah, I, but you know, look at a, a baseball batter, right? right? Baseball, what, they get, they get a hit every four, right? right? right. Um, so there's a lot of rejection there. I mean, you, you, you pitch one perfect game, you can miss, you know, 20 after it and you still have good numbers, right? So for me, um, I was so fulfilled. I didn't want to be a celebrity. I had enjoyed the parts I did so much. I was ready to take a break. I had worked 20 years. I mean, most people can take a break after 20 or 30 yeah. years of doing it. And what I didn't expect, that there's a, a, a legacy, there's a, a fan base out there that's still interested in seeing me do something. What I didn't expect that, you know, that this industry is one that supports people of any age. You know, I mean, it is the most diverse industry in the world, for sure. That's its blessing. And inclusive, absolutely. Yes. And, um, you know, uh, I guess what happened, you know, I started with, like, Little House on the Prairie. Um, you know, I did a Michael Landon's life story about right. a kid who went to bed. Yes. But then I, after that, I did, like... All the 70s shows that were out there, Adam 12, Gunsmoke, Lassie, Wonder Woman, Bionic Woman, Murder, She Wrote, you know, Cannon. Um, it, was, it was a good industry. What happened is um, it thinned out along with my hairline. <laughs> no, I think crack probably had quite a bit to do with uh, mine, just as, you know, your self-image is just not really healthy. You don't want to be out there um, putting yourself out and people don't want to see you. So I had to take a step back and uh, do some work on my life, you know, and then... Uh, you became a pastor. Uh, well, here's what happened. 
God got a hold of me. I mean, I had um, tried, I've been to 12 rehabs, two psych wards, it's like I couldn't get it, you know, I, I, I knew I shouldn't be doing that, but I didn't want to hurt anybody, but it, my Rolodex was stuck. If it was my choice and I could do whatever I want, I want to get high. And um, that short-term gain of ah was always followed by long-term pain. Mm. So I just started going for the short-term pain that I might have some long-term gain. So God got a hold of me. It was the one time in my life that I wasn't worried about what show I'm going to work on. You know, and so I decided to give some time to God. And um, for 15 years, I was with uh, Calvary Chapel's U-Turn for Christ. And it's a Christ-centered discipleship branch. We began a pastor with Calvary Chapel. And we went to Hawaii and opened up a rehab on an island where there wasn't one. And kids are having a tough time of it there, you know. And so um, it's been good. It's been fulfilling. I'm in that time, I uh, was married now for 20 years. And we have five kids. Like, I feel like it just had the best of both worlds. Has anybody in your family said, I want to go into acting or performing? Have you had that talk? Well, my brother Shane always worked with me from about... I don't know, a couple of years into it, when they started the first series, The Family Holback, he was my stand-in. And he stayed on and worked in the industry. Uh, my second oldest daughter um, loves theater and is going to school for that, is in college now. And, is, and then my other one wants to be a makeup artist in the studio. And, yeah, and I, and I don't really don't care what they want to do. I, I want them to find something they want to do. And... Um, yeah, we'll see. My son is the youngest. I have four daughters, okay. and I finally got a boy. And the boy, um, I think he wants to be a gamer. Really? Uh, yeah. Do you play games with him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you try. He plays games with me. Let's oh, put okay. it that way. I'm I'm pretty straight up with him. Hard to compete with him. He'll play like four different games at the same time on. Play. Yeah. He he um he'll beat the whole game and all the levels in like 27 minutes. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm not at that level. Okay. Plus, uh, you know, I'm Pac-Man. Me too. Scott Bayo and I did a, a Pac-Man, celebrity Pac-Man turn. When it, Get out of here. And um, it was funny because on my first person, or my first little, whatever you call them, I had like 69,000, which, you know, which is nothing. But it was more than any of them put together. But I was in such a frenzy, I broke the joystick off. <laughs> And, and Scott just kept going. Wow. And so I got a second one in a new game, and, and he ended up getting first place. I got second. And um, forget Emmy Awards. Forget, you know, like the Golden Globes. I wanted to win the Pac-Man contest, <laughs> get that arcade game. But, uh, yeah, eh, I couldn't tell you. All right. Well, I appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, you, you covered ground I didn't think you would go into. You talked about Michael Landon, um, which I was going to ask you about that movie. It, did you get... I got to ask it. Did anybody make fun of you for being in that film? The, you know, the life story of Michael? Michael Landon did. He did? Oh, yeah. Mike was a consummate professional, but he wasn't above teasing you. Oh, yeah. He'd be pouring the wet pee on me in the bed. It's all nice and warm. And he'd be like, that's just how you remember it, huh? Yeah. Um, what a neat show to be a part of, though. Because um, I went to bed as a kid, too. Right. And, um, yeah, that was really neat. I will tell you this, that um, we're at a convention right now, right. Spooky Empire. Right. Um, and there's a lot of talk about Salem's Lot right now because of the, the new remake that's just coming out. And, and there's a lot of really committed fans to Salem's Lot. But um, There's actually two versions of Salem's Lot, right? There's the TV version it, you did and a movie version. At least two. There was the TV four-hour miniseries. It was right. a TV movie of the week, which was like a two-and-a-half-hour one. There was um, a European feature version. Right. There was uh, the DVD one. Okay. Yeah, there's a bunch of different ones out there. And um, neat show for me because as a, as a child actor in television, the main thing was get it in the can, get it done. And, you know, cut, print, moving on. Right. But that show, like, they were like, uh, did you want to do it again, Lance? Did you have any ideas? And, you know, they really took their time with it. Um, 
Toby Hooper was incredible. He talked so fast, and then I'd, I'd be trying to guess what he was going to say, and that was terrible. You know, my sister, I was like, why don't you wait and let him finish his sentence? He'd be like, what I want for you, Lance, in this scene is uh, uh, for you to be, uh, um, and I'd say, uh, scared. <laughs> well, yeah, yes, yes, I want, but I'm really looking for you to be, and I'd say, uh, uh, worried. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, and so my dad, let him finish. I was going to be profound, whatever he said. I was going to wait and wait until he said it. He said, yeah, um, what I want for you is to be waiting for me to speak, and I wouldn't. So finally he goes, what I want for you to be is in focus. So be sure and hit your mark. Gotcha. <laughs> and I was like, what? What happened to the deep stuff? <laughs> now, you know this film, just to, just to tell you a little something while I have you. Um, he used really a lot of old school cinema techniques, right? Mm -hmm. Really, not a lot, no CG, nothing like that. Right. Um, the scene at the window where I'm holding the cross, yes. and they say, go ask away, you about go this. away, yes. yeah. They shot that backwards. We started at the end of the scene, and we did everything backwards, so finally laying down, and then they'd play it forward, and, and it would look like normal, but not. Right. Some kind of a weird, uh, the smoke, instead of coming out, would be pulling in. Pulling in. Yeah, 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 so that was, it was just an incredible show to be a part of. Um, and um, I have a new show coming out. What is it? I'll plug that. What is it? The Wind and the Reckoning. What is this? Well, Jason Scott Lee, um, uh, from, you know him from um, Enter the Dragon, or what is it called, The Dragon? It's, he played Bruce Lee. Right, Enter the Dragon. Yeah, and uh, Mulan. No, Dragon. Mm -hmm. Dragon, yeah. And um, it's a Western. A quote, Western? Set in Hawaii okay. in 1890-something. It really explores the Molokai colony for leprosy right. from a different angle. Okay. Maybe it was, maybe all of them didn't have leprosy. Really? Maybe President Dole said $10 a head on any Hawaiian that you can take to the island if they got a scratch because they got to give me their land. And so they'd sign over their land. Dole, President Dole, Dole Pineapple, any... Coincidence? Well, I don't know. But I do know that they had to give up their land and annul their marriages, and they didn't all want to go. And there's a famous story Jack London wrote about um, Ko'ulau, who didn't want to go. He just assumed to die with his family on his land. And so he fought it. And um, they were in Ka'ulau Valley on Kauai. And um, it's, a, it's a famous story to the Hawaiians and really need to be a part. I pay an old Civil War soldier. Okay. Mm -hmm, and uh, that's just coming out this month. Really? The Wind in the Reckoning, yeah. Where, where can people find this? Will it be streamed? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's going to be streamed. I know it's opening right now at a film festival in Hawaii, and uh, you know, let's 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 find out. Do you think I, you're going to have to look it up? I will link it on our our Facebook page and other social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then maybe YouTube, maybe IMDb. I, I really don't know. Well, I'm glad you're in something that that you're working again, buddy. Oh, me too. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And as I get ready to leave here, I have to say this to you because of where you live. Aloha. Mm -hmm. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> and Riley and Kimmy show.